If you spend enough time out in the water, you see things that you'll remember forever. Some things you try to forget, like the first encounter I ever had with one of these fish. We were crappie fishing in Real Foot Lake, Tennessee. I saw a bobber go down like any other. My father raised his cane pole, and up from the lily pads came a flash of orange and blue, and it was all over. In June of 2005, I was fishing for post spawn bass in a flooded creek system in a major reservoir in Indiana. We were averaging multiple four to six pounders every day. One morning with dew still gleaming on the grass beds protruding from the water's surface, the calming sound of my buzz bait rippling across the top. The silent stillness of the water was violently interrupted by what appeared to be a torpedo from a dozen feet away or more. The violence of the attack could have only belonged to one creature, a fish from an era of giants. In the moments to follow, I realized one inevitable truth. The world that lies beneath the surface is as wild and ancient as ever. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Today, of course, we're talking about the mythical bowfin. It's a fish of many names, grenel, dogfish, cypress trout, swamp muskie, blackfish, cottonfish, swamp bass, chupic, and beaverfish. There are loads of others, and many regional di dialects have names for them as well. You don't get that many names by accident. You have to earn them. First thing to note about this fish is that it is ancient. How ancient? You ever heard of the Triassic? Yeah, that ancient. It's the sole surviving species of the Helicomorphi, a group of fish only known from the fossil record. There are several of these species of fish that belong to this group. Uh, they all pretty much look very similar. They have uh, some different fin configurations for the most part, but they're all relatively the exact same fish. Uh, the bowfin itself, I found, has existed in its current form for about 150 million years. This makes them a favorite among scientists to study due to the certain morphological characteristics they've retained. The two most notable features are robust fin skeleton and the ability to breathe air due to an enlarged swim bladder that acts as a modified lung, making them bimodal breathers, like gar, for example. These are also the closest living relatives of the bowfin. Regarding your unique fin structure. I found an interesting quote from M. Brant Hawkins. He's a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University. He said, and I quote, discovering that both in fins don't express FGF8 is like finding a car that runs without a gas pedal. So I thought that was cool. So let's take a look at their native range as well as their current ranges. And this is where they're found primarily throughout the Mississippi drainage in Eastern US, which is pretty straightforward. Uh, are they invasive? The short answer is no. In fact, that's the only answer I could find. They are not considered invasive anywhere they are found. I found that to be odd because almost every single fish is invasive in some capacity. I mean, I didn't even know crappie were invasive, but apparently they were. Uh, but these fish, it, I couldn't find anything about them being invasive in any waterways. However, there is one very similar fish that in one small episode of River Monsters caused the deaths of untold thousands of bowfin. This is, of course, the northern snakehead. So as you can see, these two fish share some surprising similarities, but it all stops there. These fish are not related. It's simply a mild case of convergent evolution in regards to their similar form. The two most distinguishing features are short rounded anal fin, which is in sharp contrast to an elongated squared anal fin of the snakehead. The other feature is a uh, being very distinguishable black dot at the top back base of its tail fin. Uh, the snakehead lacks this feature, However, this hasn't deterred thousands of mistaken anglers from simply dispatching these fish out of ignorance. But ignorance of its identity is only rivaled by the sheer lack of understanding of how these fish interact with its environment. We've all heard it. Kill everyone you see. They eat all the bluegill, they eat all the crappie. They're destroying the ecosystem. They'll ravage a fishery, eat your wife and kids, as if that wasn't bad enough. After they've managed to gulp all that down, they'll feast on your largemouth bass. Now, if that doesn't, inspire torches and pitchforks, I don't know what will. Guys, it's bullshit. This is an unfair stigma passed down through generational misinformation and fueled by tournament fishermen fearing that there might be another mid-tier predator out there competing with bass. You know what competes with bass? Other bass. You know what eats more bass than both them? Humans. That's with an estimated 90 to 95% catch and release culture. You know what else eats more bass than both them? Other bass. You know what eats more bass than other bass? Birds of prey. Here's a picture of an osprey eating a bass. 
The bass was so big, the osprey couldn't even try to pick it up. It had to eat it right there. One really good study I was able to pull off the internet was the differences in metabolic rates between bowfin and largemouth bass. As you can tell from reading this, the scientists conclude bass had a much higher metabolic rate. I'm gonna keep going, but you guys can pause the video right here to finish reading. Uh, why is the metabolic rate important? The metabolic rate of a fish determines many things, most notably its feed rate, uh, how much it ingests. Higher rate needs more food, pretty simple. So the real question here I have is why aren't bass fishermen both in fishermen? They fight five times harder, they strike with the violence of a muskie, and nobody wants to eat them. It's a perfect fit. And you say, okay Dave, you've convinced me. I wanna go after these fish where I'll find them. Easy. Bowfin preferred vegetated sloughs, lowland rivers, lakes, swamps, uh, backwater areas, usually hiding in areas with uh, low current and near vegetation or sunken logs, so they like cover. Uh, I found these things in flood water most of the time. Backwater floods, flooding stage areas, uh, places off of reservoirs that have little creek systems and things like that. That's where I found them. So yeah, bass fishermen should love them. I mean, they're perfect. Just don't try and lick them. Their mouth is chock full of needle-like teeth. So what do they eat? Their diet is remarkably similar to largemouth bass, which includes things like smaller fish, crustaceans, ducklings, amphibians, and bugs. Pretty straightforward. This is why they're caught often by bass fishermen using soft plastics and lip baits. They're also caught by cat fishermen on live and cut bait. True generalists among carnivores. It's not wrong to think of them as spring cleaners clearing a waterway of dead or rotting animal matter that produces oxygen absorbing bacteria. See, bowfin good. So how do big bowfin make baby bowfins? Spawning takes place in April, June, depending on where you live in the US. Nests are constructed by a male in areas of vegetation, which is cleared out by the male and fanned down to expose the solid bottom. This is necessary due to the female eggs being created with a sticky substance that adheres them to the bottom. She lays down about 55,000 eggs and this usually occurs at night. Uh, males will guard the nest with their lives. After eight to 10 days, the eggs will hatch and ball up in a very tight ball. And the males will continue to guard the fry for about nine days, which makes them the most dutiful parents of all the species we've covered so far. Males will exhibit some vibrant colors during their spawn, most notably a sharp green tint uh, on their underbelly, but are not limited to just green or the stomach area. Both in reach sexual maturity at around two to three years of age. Not much on the growth rates, however, you can expect them to grow 12 to 14 inches in their first year. Both in are considered a rough fish, which means they don't serve as a traditional sport fish or table fare. Uh, however, both of these traditions are being reversed with the age of social media, things like recipes and general knowledge of how to prepare these fish have become widespread as well as their reputation as ferocious fighters and explosive strikers, slowly increasing their prowess uh, within the sport fishing community. Guys, I hope you enjoyed that video. I had a ton of fun making it. If you would, please like the video. Please subscribe. It's free and it helps my channel out a lot. And as always, if you guys want to see the next fish, you always want to see what it is, you guys can ask me and make a poll, whatever you want to do, and tell me what fish you want to see next, and I'll make it. I hope you enjoyed that video, and I'll see you in the next one.